Welcome to the ORI FPGA meetup for the 5th of March. Uh, Ken, are you ready to present your, your work and uh, explain what's going on? Yeah, um, pretty much where we left it in the uh, Slack, uh, I'm having issues with getting the ADI to the ADI reference design to, to accept the polyphase filter block as, as its own. I'm calling a macro to say hook up the ASI bus and a tickle script, but it doesn't seem to want to uh, stitch that up. I've tried different address widths. I've tried double checking all the IO to make sure they're matching. Um, fixed a couple little things along the way, but uh, still no no luck um, getting it to stitch. So, okay, how I can we help? A, Matthew had a couple suggestions based on what I posted yesterday. Paul helped me uh, upload the uh, directory to GitHub, and he looked at it. And he had some comments. Uh, I'll catch up with him if he's not on this call when, whenever he's available. I'm here. I meant uh, Matthew. OK, we'll keep moving forward. All right, I'll go ahead and give an update. I have uh, some some work from the uh, from Opulent Voice, the uplink uh, protocol that we're that we're using, and the implementation here is the uh, model based design that we're we're trying to uh, turn into HDL that will also go into the reference design uh, that Ken's using. Uh, so Ken's trying to implement a polyphase filter bank channelizer. And the channels will feed into uh, the work that I'm doing for the receiver. So what you see on the screen is a model and Simulink for um, the digital down conversion part of the design. And at the top in blue is the uh, beginning of the clock recovery and carrier synchronization uh, part of the design. So since we are using minimum shifting, we need to use co a coherent uh, receiver techniques. And that's what this part's about. Uh, so there's been some some big progress, uh, big steps forward over the past week. And thank you to to Paul uh, and and Ken and and Matthew um, and also so Ed and Talak for for comments. Um, but we we've made some some good progress in in understanding and and achievements. Uh, we have a couple of different methods for clock recovery that we're going to explore. This particular one here is uh, fairly straightforward bandpass filtering on the top and um, top and bottom, uh, what you would call arms of the of this part of the receiver. Um, some combining and all that. So we'll we'll go ahead and and, and publish this work. Uh, but we will need to improve it in order to get a higher cl quality clock. There's some some drawbacks in just having a essentially a digital bandpass filter, uh, you know, cascaded low pass and high pass to make two bandpass filters um, to to extract the clock. And on the the lower end, here's a slightly uh, better view of the here's your received samples uh, coming in and. Uh, down conversion, so digital down conversion, which is working. And we were able to to find an error, an uh, interesting one. Um, there's a discrepancy between the the papers in this particular uh, field uh, for for all of this uh, and uh, essentially the the down conversion and and the the YouTube videos and and the the more accessible kind of free uh, videos about about how to receive minimum shift keying. And it's a sign error. Um, so that was very interesting to kind of to find and learn about. And so we'll 
we'll write something up and and publish it but we've corrected the error and once that that sign error was corrected uh, and in short the wikipedia article appears wrong and the original paper is right and when you use the right math then the, the signal pops right out here is a view stepping back so the the block that you see is all of this stuff uh, you know the actual receiver which we're calling the device under test it's a subsystem the subsystem is the target for hdl conversion so we create hdl from this particular model uh, everything outside of the model is essentially the test bench and here you have a essentially a transmitter so this is creating the signals that are delivered to the receiver these are test signals and we've done a lot of work here too so it's uh, been refined and cleaned up and improved over time so that's what this is all about uh, so today we we paused work after we'd gotten a lot of progress over the past week and decided to go ahead and run it through the conversion program from HDL Coder. And it passed the, the first set of tasks. It just set the target. Everything there worked. Uh, the AXI interfaces were accepted uh, by the uh, conversion program or the workflow advisor. And um, the model advisor report uh, passed, which is which is good. This is the part of the progress, part of the process where it looks at the model and and runs a lot of checks to to prepare it for HDL code generation. Um, so that that worked. Uh, the next part, the actual generation of the RTL code and IP core uh, did not pass. So there's some some failures there. Um, and the, the report is extensive and will give a lot of feedback. So, so we'll have some, good, uh, some good, good things to work on there. So you can sort of see, if you look in here, you can see that there's a gain block with fixed point input and floating point gain parameter is not supported. So I threw a gain block in somewhere. That's gonna be easy to fix, uh, but that's where we're at as of today. That's a, a good place to be. And, um, that's what it looks like when you when you run it through the HDL workflow advisor. So we're we're down to the we've gotten a lot of the the stuff out of the way. It's set up correctly uh, for the most part. The fixed point conversion was correct, uh, but there's some some problematic blocks. It's probably the the gain block that that is in there and it probably left it on defaults. And then I took a bunch of of uh, screenshots and. I will go ahead and turn it over to to Paul, uh, and I'll I'll go ahead and look through the screenshots and see if there's anything in there that uh, that might be uh, good to share uh, in terms of the, like the the waveforms. So we're we're generating good what looks to be good minimum shift keying waveforms with no phase discontinuities, and we're now into the the what is considered by many to be kind of the heart of uh, of this. Uh, you know, the heart of digital design, which is essentially synchronization and, and clock recovery and things like that. So this was where we're going to be spending a lot of time and getting it right, uh, comparing, contrasting different methods. Uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to Paul to talk about whatever he wants to talk about over the past week. And uh, and then uh, Matthew can can take it from from there. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully you're hearing me. I'm on a, on a cellular link up at my place on the on Palomar mountain using 120 inch screen, <laughs> which is kind of silly, but it's fun. Um, I have very little to report. Uh, remote lab is cooking along, working away. Uh, it's going to need a scheduled maintenance window sometime coming up pretty soon because of the uh, need for a software update and reboot. But there's no hurry on that, as far as I know. Um, I've mostly been rubber being rubber duck for uh, for Michelle. Uh, she'll explain a, a problem to me and then solve it. And I just I can just stand there and look wise and and take a little bit of the credit while she gets the work done. Um, I don't have anything right on the agenda uh, related to FPGA, so I'll pass it over to Matthew.
Hey, um, just was playing around with some of the uh, like a GNU radio flow graph for the um, uh, MSK modem. Um, and just it so it's just kind of interesting, kind of a learning for me. I haven't really used uh, GNU radio before. Um, and then uh, Paul was nice enough to get me set up um, both um, for the MATLAB usage and as well as uh, the Vado on some of the virtual machines. Uh, so that with MATLAB, I can maybe help with some um, Simulink components if we need to uh, put some together for the uh, synchronization. And as well, then I, I was looking at um, Ken's problem a little bit. Uh, and so I have the Vivado um, environment set up and I'm able to run the scripts. Um, but I think there's a couple things still missing. I've um, messaged Ken about that. But I, I think I've narrowed down the, the problem that he's seen um, and hopefully we can get that resolved. Oh, that's, that's real good. That'd be a big step forward. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of curves to show um, the what we what we found in the modulation uh, of of minimum shift keying to to get it uh, thoroughly right. And since a, a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, now a video being worth a thousand pictures, a video would be even better. But here we are making a video, so I'm going to show a uh, real quick a uh, couple of screenshots from the output of the of of our modulation. This is the visualization from, from Simulink. This is time domain stuff. What you do is you pick your signals and you log them, uh, and then you're able to, to show them uh, in, a, in a, a presentation like this. Uh, so kind of nice to be able to look at all this and, and compare it. The top pane here is our bitstream. And this is when you get your bitstream uh, that you want to, to transmit, you divide it into even and odd bits, and each of those bits is then extended out from a bit time to a symbol time. In our case, we have uh, a symbol is two bits. So you extend, you double the, the length of your of your bit. What you also do, because uh, uh, minimum shift keying is also offset QPSK, you offset your, uh, let's say the, you know, the, the essentially the, the even, uh, or no, the, sorry, the odd. Let's see, the odd is one. You keep that, and you you offset the even by by one uh, bit time. Okay, so these are going to be staggered. You're staggering the even and the odd bits. You've taken them. You've divided them up into two streams. You stagger them out. And what this does is it's really clever. It makes it to where only one bit changes at a time. And this has all sorts of good effects. Okay, so, so that's great. Then. You take these rectangular pulses and you're going to, to multiply them by, by what we call an orthogonal signal. So what this does is you can see in the bottom pane um, that instead of rectangular pulses, you're going to have uh, sinusoidal pulses. Um, and when the, the bits change, then you have a reversal of 180 degrees, uh, essentially phase shift. And when it stays the same, then the you get the, the sinusoid. So all of this math works out to be a really nice signal that you can see in the in the middle when you add them all together. It is the minimum frequency shift keying, uh, and everything works out with no phase discontinuities. So so after kind of a lot of effort, we we were able to get to this point. Um, but here here was the thing that kind of hung us up for a while. The you can see on the bottom or in the middle, sorry, the middle the the you know the carrier. Uh, frequency because you modulate by a carrier follows your information signal. And in the bottom, it looks like it's exactly opposite. And so this popped up in the math and we were kind of confused. And with Matthew's help, uh, it turns out that there's a there's a sign error in some of the more common explanations. So just taking, you know, uh, uh, YouTube videos from professors at universities and assuming that that was correct was, uh, it turns out that, that it was that it was not. So going back to the, the original paper, uh, which with Matthew, Matthew did, uh, found that it was a sign error. Now, once that was corrected, it went from, from this, where the uh, even 
signal or the even bitstream uh, was was wrong and the odd was correct, which meant that you know uh, the the outcome was never going to work. Uh, once that sign error got fixed, then it it went back to to both of them uh, being lined up as expected. And then as soon as that happened, the digital down converter was was producing signals that looked right. So this was this could have probably I'd say been prevented if we maybe had not just simply Googled a bunch of videos from professors on YouTube and not simply stopped at the Wikipedia article, but actually gone back and double checked the the references and the footnotes. So the sh that all that that extra work shouldn't be necessary, but it's just a, a good lessons learned on on dealing with these sorts of things. So that's where we're at. I think we've got a pretty good solid test bench. Um, and we'll be moving forward with that and a device under test and uh, continually trying to keep it converted, uh, trying to run a, the workflow advisor for HDL coder to, to keep good copies of, of as much HDL as possible. Uh, there will come a day where we will depart from the model-based design where we're kind of living in Simulink and seeing it work in Simulink. And, and then we'll take our HDL code base and then we'll start working with that as the sort of the, the locus of, of attention and uh, make sure that that's good, solid, uh, shareable, publishable code. And uh, that's that's where that's where we're at this week. I've got a bunch of other cool curves. Uh, this is what some of this stuff looks like. This is the uh, after you you take your orthogonal um, signaling. And, and you take your rectangular pulses, so you, it's all very baseband. Uh, then you can make some some lovely curves. Uh, this is what it looks like when you kind of multiply it up. These are your carrier components that you're going to add together. So you're adding the the two top panes, and you're making the bottom one. It's it's really quite nice when it actually is correct. Um, it looks looks quite lovely. So that's where that's where we're at this week. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And I, I think, so I'm in good shape. Uh, I'm going to keep keep working on this stuff and see what we can do. Uh, I'm going to keep uh, trying to, to solve any of the remaining problems. There's been lots of swapping in and out and trying different blocks and backing up and starting over on the model. And this has caused the errors in HDL coder, the workflow advisor. So. I'm going to take a little bit of time today to clear those out and get our model uh, working really well, then go back to the model and keep working. I did have a question. Um, so when you would, have you chosen or are you, are you intending a particular demodular synchronization scheme? Because I, um, the reason I ask is I, was, I sent you some excerpts from one of the papers where they discuss, um, you know, frequency tracking in, in terms of Doppler shift and, you know, that, that there was a, another synchronization method that performed better. And um, so, I mean, I, I believe, if I understand correctly, this, these would be systems that would be subject to Doppler shift and frequency tracking, right? Yeah, I think that's uh, safe, safe to assume. assume. We will be subject to Doppler and frequency tracking, so... Yes, I would like to uh, try to implement the the things from the paper mm -hmm. and compare it against whatever we can get working in the meantime. So yeah, enthusiastic thumbs up. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that for for me. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate the references and the uh, the the attention to the to the problem space. At one paper, I thought it was really interesting about um, testing, or you know, they did a lot of simulation. Even uh, I think they even had a couple of test flights, if I understood, um, with the different receivers, and so they were able to get some good data on the performance of them. So I thought that was a useful paper. I thought for our context. <laughs> yeah, I was really excited to see actual results. You know, instead of it all being just in math, um, mm -hmm. so that 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 increases. The amount of confidence I have about, you know, about investigating, implementing, adapting, and working with it, and it's it's right up our alley. For 
like for Hio, um, we have an interesting sort of Doppler curve because the the highly elliptical orbits, uh, the you know, there's there's a number of things that that are done, and uh, these orbits, um, you know, go very quickly when they're close to the Earth, and they're very slow when they're further away, and you know, a lot of of satellites, especially if they're they're kind of kind of broader band or um they, they'll they'll just guarantee okay well we're it's going to work really well when it's further away moving slower and that you just pass through a zone that it works and then it was zooming by the earth uh at essentially you know much closer to leo that sorry you know it's it's a catch it if you can so that's the very challenging type of orbit um and in, in some of the commercial deployments that I've looked at and I'm familiar with, then you have a constellation of these and they're they're only really active when they're far away and the Doppler is fairly low. It's still a significant uh, amount of Doppler, especially for the like broadband or, or digital or small payloads. And then looking at geo, that's totally different. Not a whole lot of Doppler there, although it does move around. Um, so less of a concern, but uh, I think Probably, you know, being firmly focused on, uh, you know, the what what is the limit of the Doppler that we can accommodate? What are some real use cases? What are what can we what sorts of things can we be prepared to take advantage of uh, in terms of flights? Um, and talking with the other organizations that we work with that are that are much more uh, close to to flights, uh, you know, some of the AMSAT. Uh, groups and and um, uh, you know some of the, some of the other uh, companies. There, you know, we may actually uh, have access to to something that would be highly elliptical. So, yeah, I think uh, yes, like today is where the capacity for being able to take advantage of those flights can happen. And working in uh, Doppler today is good. Um, and as Paul has raised in the in the past, uh, there's a whole lot that the ground station can do in order to mitigate this, that predicting where you are will relieve a lot of that burden or, you know, go, go a long way so that the ground station knows the, uh, the position of the satellite, knows what time it is, and can reduce the uncertainty by quite a bit. And then the rest of it is just good algorithms and good Doppler awareness, Doppler correction. So yeah, we're, we're at the right time to start folding that into the design, learning how to do it and making sure that we do a good job. And then I would, the, I would expect the sounding rockets would have an interesting Doppler. Program. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, um, being able to, to work with the university of Puerto Rico on their sounding rockets, uh, the, cause they, um, they've been really, really good about including both, uh, uh, audio and visual recordings of the the rocket launches and um that that has paid off for them in at least two ways so they've published these videos of what it's like to be in a sounding rocket and it's amazing it's uh violent and very very fast and so the this is a great opportunity to test doppler so we we've done a done a lot of of trying to take advantage of it like wow you know you could really test your uh, for instance, the LoRa project, the, the Ambisat project, it's like, okay, we could really actually prove out these uh, theoretical claims on on being resistant to Doppler because it's so fast. Um, and the the other way that it's that it's kind of worked in their advantage is because they they record sound and and video. And um, last year, or this last round at Wallops, the sounding rocket failed, and the recordings that the University of Puerto Rico had that they made just as a, it's just what they do, have turned out to be very useful because that's how uh, NASA figured out what happened to an otherwise extremely reliable sort of low risk, uh, you know, platform that uh, it doesn't fail very often. But but when it does, it's it's good to figure it out. And, and their recordings turned out to be uh, very important to the process. Um, and very few of the other schools were were doing that sort of thing, recording at that resolution and and all. So yeah, the the sounding rocket stuff will be a uh, uh, it's a good opportunity. I'm looking forward to it. So so hopefully we'll be able to be on uh, 
a launch uh, this year, this coming year. We're, we're working towards that and trying to make it possible. Let's see. I think uh, anybody have any any other questions or comments for for this week? We got we got plenty plenty that's gone on and and plenty that we're doing. Maybe Matthew could just stay on after the meeting and we could talk for a couple minutes. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I'll go ahead and and shut us down. So we'll gavel out uh, for the the reporting and. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll go move right into to office hours. Thank you, everybody, so much for all of the the hard work. This is uh, it is hard work and ambitious stuff. And there's lots and lots of learning going on. It's pretty much all learning curves all the way. Uh, but we're we're making good progress. And uh, I'll see you on Slack.